Hi everyone, and uh, thank you for attending my talk. And first of all, a big thank you to the organizers of the conference for their hard work. So today I will be talking about temporal interactions between electrical pulses with cochlear implants. Particularly, we've shown recently that with cochlear implant users, if you take a pulse train, modulate it at 80 Hz and interleave it with another uh, pulse train that's modulated at 120 Hz, you can see a neural distortion response uh, at 40 Hz in the EEG, which is of thalamus cortical origin. And one of the cool things with that is that by construction, there is no energy in the signal at 40 Hz, and so there is no or little artifact coming from the implant at 40 Hz, uh, only the neural distortion response. But how can there be a neural distortion response at 40 Hz? That is only possible if, at some stage, the auditory system integrates the two pulse trains with some non-linearity following. Could it be uh, at the auditory nerve already? Um, so we want to check that uh, with the help of models of the auditory nerve with two main objectives. One is to tease apart um, different processes occurring at the auditory nerve and maybe reveal how parameters of the model need to be changed. Um, the other one is a bit more long term, is to see if we can get uh, a distortion uh, could be obtained uh, with other applications than, uh, than cochlear implant stimulations. Now, generally speaking, there are four types of interactions between pulses at the level of the auditory nerve. Uh, there is absolute and relative refractoriness. So after a neural spikes, it's impossible for a few hundred microseconds. Uh, or harder for a few milliseconds to make it spike again. There's also facilitation. Um, that is when you have two sub-threshold pulses. If you present them within a short window, uh, it can make the neuron uh, spike. And there's also accommodation and uh, spike, rate, spike rate adaptation, but I won't, um, I won't touch much on them because they're not the most impactful here. Now we use two computational models of the auditory nerve, uh, one that includes only refractoriness and spike rate adaptation from Virtue et al. Uh, 2022, and the second one that additionally includes facilitation and accommodation by Joshi et al. 2017. And in both cases, um, we model 1500 neurons and we have a threshold distribution based on the Virtue et al. 2022 model for consistency. The stimuli were um, two 480 pulse per second uh, pulse trains modulated at 80 and 120 Hz and separated by a variable interpulse interval ranging from 0 to 1000 microseconds. That is, they were either right next to each other or the worst equidistant. We then measured the sum neural activity at 40 Hz uh, over one second. So before going into the modeling results, um, this is what we measured in cochlear implant users with the exact same stimuli. Uh, on the x-axis is the interpulse interval between the two pulse trains, and on the y-axis the amplitude of the neural distortion response. And what we saw is that the neural distortion response is pretty constant from zero to about two to three hundred microseconds, but then it drops to be into the noise floor at the longest gap tested of uh, one millisecond. And these are the results obtained with both models. The black line is the noise floor, and the yellow line is the amplitude of the model near response at 40 Hz. You can first see that both models uh, do create a distortion at 40 Hz, but then none of the models accurately predicts the reduction at longer at the out. For the Borussia et al. model uh, on the left, um, it's flat throughout. For the Joshi et al. model, there's this beating pattern. Um, an interesting thing is that the mechanism of generation of this distortion varies between the models and IPI. It's actually dominated by facilitation at short IPIs in the Joshi et al. model um, and by refactoriness at longer IPIs and uh, also in the Broche et al. model. Uh, remember that there's no facilitation built in uh, in the uh, Broche et al. model. So to show a bit more what I mean by this, here are like 25 milliseconds, that's one 40 hertz cycle of the average neural response to our stimulus with a short interpulse interval. And let's focus on what happens at the highest amplitude of the modulations shown by the arrows. 
For the blue, the 80 per second pulse strain, uh, there's two peaks in the 25 millisecond cycle. And the neural response is actually pretty similar at both peaks, about 4% of the neurons spiking. Actually, for the first peak, it's a bit hard to see because of the response to the other pulse strain, but when you zoom in, uh, you can see it's about 4% of the neurons spiking. Um, now, the response to the red, the 120 Hz pulse strain, in general, uh, is a bit stronger than for the 80 Hz pulse strain. But also, it's not constant across its three peaks. And that's because the red pulses come about 100 microseconds right after a blue pulse and are therefore sometimes facilitated. And because the amount of facilitation differs uh, across one cycle, that's how a component is created uh, at 40 Hz in the EEG, in the FFT. Now, this is the same plot on the right, uh, but for the case where the interpulse interval is at 900 microseconds. You can see that the red pulses are now shifted away from the blue pulses by 900 microseconds. In general, the neural response is overall a little weaker for 5% maximum, but also the pattern of modulation is completely different now. And that's because at these interpulse intervals, facilitation does not play a role anymore, but refractoriness does. For example, the first blue pulse strongly masks the first red pulse. And this also means that the resulting phase of the 40 Hz component differs to the previous, uh, to the 100 microseconds case. On the left, the strongest peak now is at uh, 0 milliseconds, while now on the right, the weakest peak is at 0 milliseconds. And this is why you see this beating pattern in the Joshi et al. model, because there's this shift in phase by pi between two, the two mechanisms. And we have preliminary data that we're collecting now that suggests that in RCI users, the phase of the MDR is a bit better aligned with a refractoriness based uh, mechanism. Finally, in the Broch et al. model, the absolute refractoriness time period is about 700 microseconds, and the relative refractoriness is exponential with a time constant of 1.5 milliseconds. Now we changed that to much shorter values, and this did recreate the patterns in, in CI users. So it could be an indication that refractory and time constants are shorter than usually modeled with, and it's actually consistent with a recent study by Skidmore et al, where they derive such constants from ECAP recordings. And although the limitation here is that we're only modeling the auditory nerve and comparing against the measure done at the cortical level. To conclude, so neural distortions uh, caused by temporal interactions uh, between pulses may already be present at the level of the auditory nerve, and modeling studies may reveal the nature of these interactions, for example, refractoriness versus facilitation. Uh, and fine tuning models of the uh, response to the auditory nerve to electrical stimulation uh, might be possible against such data sets. Thank you.